All right, praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to the Global Network of Kingdom Ambassadors. I am Apostle Mike, and I'm here to give all honor and glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the head of my life. We also honor um, Pastor Clovis and his wife, Pastor Darlene, and every minister on the platform. I pray everybody's doing well, and you are being blessed by the teachings that are coming through this platform, not only by me, but also Pastor David, who has been doing an amazing study through the book of Acts. So, so I pray that it's edifying you and it's strengthening you and equipping you. So we're going to continue on our series on the beta Satan. I pray that not only has it impacted you, um, the truth of these teachings, but also if it also that it ex exposed some inner things that are inside of us. Do you know that there are many things that we have gone through in life and we tend to internalize them but never deal with them? We never deal with our hurts, the pain, and even the trauma that happens in life. This is something that's common to all of us, right? We all have been hurt in some way, and we have been hurt even by people that, that were so close to us, right? And we tend to carry these things in our lives right? Because we internalize them. We don't want to kind of not even remember them. We just kind of want to move on and, and live our lives. But we find ourselves struggling in certain areas of our lives, and we don't really understand why, right? We may struggle in connecting with relationships. We may struggle with authority figures for some reason. You know, we may have a challenge moving forward in the things of God. We may pray at times and we feel dry and we feel like there's no um, presence of God in our midst. We see others rejoicing and see others in the presence of God and worshiping. And it's a struggle for us to connect with God on any level, right? So because how, how we deal with trauma, difficulties, challenges, and offenses ultimately is how we are going to relate to others. Because when we are offended, right, what happens when we are offended, we are trapped literally in the offense. We are trapped in the offense. That's why this author astutely calls it the beta Satan. The offense doesn't necessarily come from Satan, but Satan uses the offense to keep us bound to keep us in this what inner prison that doesn't allow us to be all that we can be for God, right? So so, so this week, I'm going to give you something very vital, and it's something that changed my life, right? It changed my life, and it's the principle of forgiveness, forgiveness, right? And really, the premise of the teaching this week is forgiveness. You don't give, you don't get, right? Forgiveness is something that's reciprocal in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of God, right? The Bible says clearly in Mark chapter 11, verse 24 to 25, it says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, check this out, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your father also who is in heaven may forgive you your Trespasses, right? It also says somewhere else in the in the scripture when it says, "When you go, come to offer your your gift at the altar, and you remember that you have a issue or a problem with a brother, leave your gift there. Don't offer it. Go make it right with your brother. Then come and offer your gift, right? So, so, so we see by these two words from the Lord, and we see these two passages of scripture that I just mentioned, right? We see that there's a principle at work here, right? That, 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 that hinders many believers' progress in the things of God, right? Because in Mark 11, Jesus is saying, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, right? So, so, so faith and prayer work hand in hand. Right? So you can pray but not have faith. Right? You could pray and not believe. Right? But he's saying that when you ask in prayer, believe 
that you have received it. Faith, faith in operation, in prayer, and it will be yours, right? So what happens? God responds to our faith, and then what? He responds to our request in faith, right? So you see how it's happening. It's reciprocal. My faith pleases God. God blesses because of my faith. So you see what's happening here, right? So, 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 so that's how God responds. We have seen this many times in the gospel, right? We have seen Jesus respond to faith. When Jesus was encountered by the Syrophoenician woman who had a child that was demon possessed, and she went to him and asked Jesus, in fact, pleaded with Jesus if Jesus would heal her child. And Jesus said, I didn't come for you. I didn't come for you. I came for the lost children of Israel. She was outside of the covenant, outside of Israel. And he says, you know, uh, how can I throw my pearls to the dogs? Right? How can I throw my choice bread to the dogs? And, and, and she responded this way. That, was, that could have been very insulting. Jesus, in essence, was calling her a dog, right? Not directly, but that's the implication. That's probably how I would have taken it. I would have said, man, Jesus, man, you're harsh, bro. You calling me a dog? Man, I'm coming to you because I believe you can heal my child. And, but she didn't respond that way. She responded in faith. She said, that's true. But, however, the dog is able to eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. So what she's saying is that, listen, I don't need the full bread. Just give me the crumbs, Jesus. And that is enough to deliver my daughter. And Jesus was astounded. And he was astounded and he granted her request. He healed the child. He delivered the child. Even though it was outside of the covenant, the faith of that Syrophoenician woman is what moved Christ to move on her behalf. So you see the reciprocal effect in the kingdom of God. The same thing happens with forgiveness, right? Because if you don't forgive, then, then, then he cannot forgive you, right? So we must understand that unforgiveness is a sin. Unforgiveness is a sin. So Jesus is saying clearly in this passage, if you have anything against anyone, as you're entering his presence, if you have anything against anyone, forgive. So that your father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Right? So when we enter the presence of God, we don't want anything to hinder our communion with God. And oftentimes, offense and unforgiveness stand in the way of us connecting and communing with God. So he's saying, listen, deal with that first. That way I can forgive you because how many of you know that we go into the presence of God with sin? How many of you know that we sin every day? Because our flesh is weak. We fall short of the glory of God every day. So when we enter into the presence, I've learned that I need to be what? Cleansed before I come into the presence. Yes, I know that the blood of Jesus has cleansed me. I know that I am saved by grace through faith, right? But I, 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 I understand the principle of forgiveness because if I have anything against anyone, if I'm unwilling to forgive, right, after I've been forgiven, right, then that doesn't honor God. It's sinful. Then it will hinder my communion with God. So I deal with myself first. I deal with any unforgiveness. I say, Lord, Holy Spirit, show me the unforgiveness in me so I can forgive as you have forgiven me. So I can enter your presence without hindrance, right? This is, this is something that we don't pay enough attention to, right? Because we, 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 we tend to be spiritual and say, no, I'm good. But, try, but most of the time, most people, and dare I say all people, are dealing with some inner issue that they have not resolved. They're carrying some level of unforgiveness, right? So if Jesus said, forgive, so my father can forgive you. How do you know that he meant what he said? Right? Because if you don't forgive, neither will your father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Right? 
We live in a culture where we don't always mean what we say, right? We have people say things all the time and they don't mean what they said. Have you ever come across a person, right? Have you ever come across a person that that you know you're sharing something that's going through in your life and 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 and, and they're listening to you and they said, brother, man, I'm gonna pray for you, right? And then they walk away. You know that most of the time people that say that don't actually pray. I'm not suggesting that everybody that does that doesn't pray, right? But there are people that say that, simply say that because that's what we say, right? That's what we say. We say, listen, listen, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to stand with you, brother, while you're going through this difficulty. See, I've learned over the years because I have been guilty of that. I've been guilty about saying that I'm going to do something and then not do it, right? And walk away and forget. We we don't do it for different reasons because sometimes we even forget. It just slips our mind. We get involved in the busyness of our day and then we forget. We go to prayer and we forget to lift that prayer that we told that brother we were going to pray for him, right? So sometimes it's, it's, it's innocent. We just forget, right? But other times we just say that as something that we're just accustomed to say, right? So we don't really mean it. We're just saying it because we feel like it's going to be comforting to that person to say it. Right. So 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 what I've learned over the years is like when I'm in a situation and prayer is needed, if I can pray right then and there, I'm going to pray right then and there because I want to actually pray for the person. Right. I don't want to I, I, I don't want to leave it a chance or my human imperfection to get in the way of me not ministering to that individual at the time when that individual needs the ministry. Right. But the point is, is that. We live in that, that's the kind of culture we live in, right? So what happens is that a person's word is not taken seriously, right? Let me give you an example. In childhood, right, we have parents and we have kids. And, and when our kids are acting up, we tend to say things to kids. Like we, we, we tend to kind of let them know, listen, if you continue doing that, I'm going to have to spank you. I'm going to have to discipline you. I'm going to have to, you know, punish you or, or or whatever it is, right? And we say it. And the kid continues to do it over and over again. We continue to warn and we get louder. And we say, listen, I'm going to spank you. I'm going to punish you. Stop doing that. And they do it over and over again. And you keep warning them. But you never follow through with the action that you're warning them about, right? So what they end up, um, they end up growing up saying, well, I can't believe what my parents say because they say something, but they don't do it, right? And that kind of affects them when they grow up so they don't trust the word of any authority figure because of that, right? But Jesus is different, right? Jesus is different because when he speaks, he really means what he says, right? We used to say this back in the day when I was growing up in my neighborhood. And I grew up in the inner city, and this was the saying we used to say in the Bronx, right? And we used to say, my word is bond, right? So whatever we say, man, take it to the bank, is bond. We had to, like, own up to our word. It was, a, it was a level of disrespect when you say something and not do it. That's the way it was back in the day. But more and more these days, people say things, but they don't really mean it. Um, I remember one time, the pastor's son in my church, you know, he was doing a social experiment, right? And so, so he was walking around the church, and as he engaged in com conversation, you know, people would generally say, "Hey, brother, how you doing?" Right? And then he would respond and say, "Man, I'm doing horrible, man. I'm having a horrible week, man. I don't know what's going on in my life, but man, this has been rough." Right? And then the people just continue the conversation as if he didn't say anything. And he so he went to several people, and and that happened. And then he came up to me and he said, "I said, hey, hey, brother, how you doing?" He said, "Man, I'm horrible, man. I'm doing horrible, man. Things ain't working out for me. This and this and that." And he went on and on. And I said, "Brother, what happened? You know what's going on, man? Do you want to talk about it, man? I'm here for you, brother." And he and he was like, "No, no, no." He, then he revealed that this was a social experiment. He said, no, 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 I'm not really horrible. I just, I'm just trying to see if people actually pay attention to what others are saying. 
Are we actually engaging each other in conversation, right? Is there any compassion in people's heart? Or they just really trying to, they just saying that just to say it, right? But you're the only one. I went to 10 different people and you're the only one that that that, that inquired more, that, that listened to what I was saying and, 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 and wanted to be there for me. So, so you see, that is what is in our society. But Jesus is one that whatever he says, he means, right? He wants us to take him seriously. We cannot view what he says the way we view other authorities or relations in our lives, right? When he says something, he means it. He is faithful even when we are faithless. He walks at a level of truth and integrity that transcends our culture or society. So when Jesus said, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. He meant it. To take this one step further, he does not He does not say this just once in the gospel, but many times, right? Matthew 6, verse 12, he says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, right? So there he's teaching the disciples how to pray. And in that pattern of prayer is that particular verse. Forgive us our debts or trespasses as we also have forgiven those who trespass against them, right? So we forgive, so it's contingent, right? Forgive us as we have forgiven. Forgive us, we're asking, petitioning God, forgive us as we have forgiven others, right? Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15 says this, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. That's very clear. That's just a clear directive from the Lord, right? It's what? Conditional. It's reciprocal. We forgive, he forgives. He forgives, we should forgive. You see, you, you, you see what's happening, right? So when we understand that forgiveness is so powerful and unforgiveness is powerful, in a negative direction. When we have when we harbor unforgiveness, right? It impacts our communion with God, number one. And also it affects the relationship around us. Right? We become cynical. We become people that 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 you know don't trust anybody. Right? We come we become bitter individuals. And little by little we start to disconnect from people, and we start to have a little disconnect with them. And these are happening because we're harboring unforgiveness. Stress takes over, anxiety happens, and all these things are results of unforgiveness. Luke 6, verse 37 says this, judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. See? In the principle, it's always reciprocal, right? If you don't want to be judged, don't judge is what he's saying, right? But if you judge, know that the same measure you're using is going to be used against you, right? It's a reciprocal. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned, right? The same thing, right? What you give out, you would receive, right? So that's why we always have to what? Do things with right motive. Do things from a right perspective. We got to take the log out of our eye before we take the speck out of our brother's eye. We got to first, when, when there is something to confront, we first have to confront ourselves. See if my motive is right. See if I'm not just trying to exert authority where I shouldn't exert authority. Or I'm trying try to show that I'm better than somebody else. Do I have a prideful motive to come to you? Or do I really care about you? Do I really want to help you? Do I love you enough to tell you the truth so you can be free? Right? What's my motive? God knows. Allow God to deal with you first. Allow him to see, so to show you the log in your own eye. So you can see clearly the speck in your brother's eye. And you could truly help. Right? And then finally he says, but if you do not, wait, it also says forgive and you will be forgiven. If you forgive, you will be forgiven, right? So you see the reciprocal nature. 
So I wonder how many Christians will want God to forgive them in the same way they have forgiven those who have offended them. Yet this is exactly the way in which they will be forgiven. Because unforgiveness is so rampant in our churches, catch this, we do not want to take these words of Jesus so seriously. Rampant or not, truth does not change. The way we forgive, release, and restore another person is the way we will be forgiven. Right? So, 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 so we tend to justify ourselves. We say, no, you know, this person doesn't deserve to be forgiven. Right? Look at what they've done. You know, how can I just release that? How can I act like it never happened, right? But the truth of the matter is that you're sinning against God by not forgiving you, right? Because he says, listen, my forgiveness is contingent on your forgiveness. Right? So we get bitter, we get angry, we get upset, we rehearse the, the hurt and the pain. We say, no, that person doesn't deserve it. Let me tell you something. Do you deserve God's mercy? Did you deserve God's grace? Did you deserve for Jesus to hang on that cross in excruciating pain and let the wrath of God fall on him for your sin, for your offense, for what you did to God? Do you think you deserve that? If not, we if you think you deserve that, we got to talk. Because I know for sure, and the Bible backs me up on this, we did not deserve that. It was an act of grace. Grace is unmerited favor. It means I didn't deserve it, but he did it anyway. His love is greater than my offense. And he, was, he, he, he took it on so I can be forgiven. So who am I? To, to deem that someone else doesn't deserve to be. All right? And this is the way we forgive is the way we're going to be forgiven. Right? So we must understand that the truth does not change. The truth does not compromise. The truth is the truth. So let me give you a passage of scripture that's going to illustrate what I'm sharing with you this week. And I pray that you catch this. And I pray that you allow Holy Spirit to probe you as I'm sharing, because it's very important that we be released of all unforgiveness and thus be released of all offenses that may be operating in our inner man and affecting the outward expression of our lives. Right? So check this out. Matthew chapter 18 Verses 21 to 35. I know it's lengthy, but I want to read the full context and the full story. So that way we can we can draw from it what Jesus is trying to teach and communicate. Right? So it reads, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you 77 times, but 77 times. Right? So I'm going to stop right here for a moment. Right? I'm going to take a detour and I'm going to say, okay. So now Peter comes up to Jesus. And he and because and, Jesus has taught them about forgiveness. And he's he coming up to him. He said, Lord, how often should I forgive my brother if he sins against me? How many often should I forgive them? Seven times? Is seven times sufficient? If I do it seven times, and Peter must have thought that he was going to impress the Lord with that number. It's like, man, you know what I mean? It's tough to forgive somebody one time. He said, listen, I'm willing to forgive them seven times. Seven times good, Lord? And Jesus said to him, no, I don't say to you seven times. He was not impressed. <laughs> he said, no, seven times. I'm saying 77 times. Or some other versions say 70 times seven times. So the real point of that matter is that there is no limit to forgiveness. Imagine if Jesus had a limit to his forgiveness. If he says, listen, I'm only going to forgive you for that sin 10 times. But after 10 times, you're on your own, man. You're going to deal with that sin. Man, you're going to die with that sin, man. You'll never be free. Jesus, not. there's no limit. So thus, we should have no limit to forgiving others. So let me continue reading. And then he shares a story, right? And then continue reading. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. 
When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Ouch. Hmm. So let's look at how this parable applies to being offended. When an offense occurred, a debt is owed. When we are hurt, a debt is owed, right? That person that hurt me has to make it right somehow. But you know what? That debt is something that is so difficult to pay. Because how can somebody, what? How can somebody come and erase the hurt that you're feeling, the devastation at the time, the breach of trust that took place in that process, and all that you've gone through in that trauma? How can that be taken away? What could the person do to make you say, okay, everything is good? Right? It's like a debt that cannot be paid by that individual, right? And, 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 and you know, and, and in the simplicity of it all, right? Just like the master forgave the debt of that servant, we plead for mercy. I know you're angry at me. I know I hurt you, but would you forgive me? And when the person says no, we're pleading because we are we we having this issue and it's not right. The debt is not being paid, and there's no way I can pay the debt. So you so 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 finally you have mercy and you say, Okay, I forgive you. And it doesn't mean everything goes right back to place and everything is good, but it goes back to the place as if the person didn't owe you in the beginning. When a debt is released, you no longer can come back and say, Okay, you owe me this, you owe me that. Right? You've been released. You've been forgiven. Right? That's what forgiven. Being forgiven is. Right? So, forgiveness is like the cancellation of a debt. The king represents God the Father who forgave this servant a debt that was impossible for him to pay. In Colossians 2, 13 and 14, we find, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of certificate of debt with us, requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he had taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Right? So the debt that we were forgiven was unpayable. There was no way we could ever repay God for what we owed him. Our offense was overwhelming, for God gave salvation as a gift. Jesus paid the certificate of debt that was against us. We can see the parallel between the servant's relationship to his king and our relationship with God, right? So check this out. The servant owed the king or the master 10,000 talents, right? So let me let me break that down and make it contemporary for you what that is. Ten th a talent is a measure it's a weight. And in that time, that currency was gold and silver. So a talent represented literally about 70 pounds of gold, right? 70 pounds of gold. So now he owed 10,000 of those talents, right? 10,000 times 70, whatever that number is, 
That is the weight of gold that he owed the servant, right? So if you look at our modern day, an ounce of gold is about close to $1,200 an ounce, right? $1,200 for an ounce of gold. There's 16 ounces to a pound. So you do the math. It equates, 10,000 talents in today's currency equates to $14.5 billion. I'm going to say it again in case you understand, you didn't hear me the first time. $14.5 billion, right? That man was a servant. There's no way he could ever pay $14.5 billion, right? So the enormity of the debt, he kept pleading. He said, I'll pay you. No, that's something we say because we can't pay you. We 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 don't we don't want to be sold into slavery. We don't want to end up in prison, right? So we're pleading for our lives. This is what this servant did. He was pleading with our lives. So now let's look at it in a spiritual context, right? The sin that we had against God, right? The wages of sin, as the Bible said, is death. Right? So the only way that we could repay our debt is by dying. And when we die, we cease to exist. And we are separated from God for all eternity, right? That is dying in your sin, dying with the debt. But Jesus went and paid the debt by dying himself. He died, right? For your sin, for my sin. Paid the debt in full. That's what Colossians 2, 13 and 14 is saying, right? The, 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 the legal demands, the debt that was all, it was nailed on the cross. It was considered paid in full. It was paid in full. We're forgiven. We're free. We are released when we put our faith and trust in Jesus. We are released from the requirement of the debt. We no longer owe it. We could have never paid it because in paying it, we cease to exist. And we no longer have an opportunity to be redeemed. But Jesus redeemed us. That is the equivalent, if we want to use natural terms, of having $14.5 billion in debt that we know in, in, in 100 lifetimes we probably couldn't pay. It. Bishop, you have $14.5 billion, Bishop? If you do, man, we got to get into partnership because there's a lot of work in the kingdom to do, right? There's only maybe a handful of people, maybe a small percentage of people in this world that have that kind of wealth, right? The regular person doesn't. The, a servant also definitely doesn't have $14.5 billion. So I wanted to paint that picture for you so you could understand the enormity of the debt and why unforgiveness is dangerous. Let me go to the next part of this story, right? So here this guy is forgiven. A huge debt, $14.5 billion debt. So he goes, he's rejoicing. He's like, oh, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. And he walks down the street and and, and, and that's me. I'm worshiping God because I got forgiven that debt, man. I'm so happy, man. And then I see Bishop, man. I see Bishop Owen walking down the street, man. And that dude owes me money, man. And he hasn't paid me, man. He's been avoiding me, man. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to go to him. I'm going to get my money, man. This is my day of blessing, man. The Lord is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. And then I go and I shake my I shake my brother up, man. We're fellow servants, man. I shake him up. I said, Bishop, man, how, how dare you, man? You owe me a hundred denarius, man. Pay me, man. Pay me my money, bro. It's been a long time I gave you, I lent you that money. You're not paying me, man. That, is that what a man of God is? And I'm dressing you down. Uh, and, and and Bishop is saying to me, man, apostle, please give me some time. I'll pay you, man. Just have mercy on me, man. Give me a little more time, patience with me, man. I, I know that I owe you the debt, man. I'll pay you. And I said, nah, man, I'm going to throw you in jail, man. Enough is enough, man. You're going to have to get punished for this, man, till you pay me. So that's what the servant did. Servant did as he was, so so he threw him into jail, right? Let me let, let, let me break down what a denarius, what a hundred denarius is is likened to. A hundred denarius, right? It's the equivalent of four thousand dollars. Okay, it's the equivalent of four thousand dollars. 
So mind you, that Serbian was forgiven $14.5 billion debt. And now he's shaking down his fellow servant for $4,000, right? You see the disparity between the debt, right? So we are so arrogant to not forgive when we've been forgiven much, so much more than we could even imagine, more than we could even fathom we've been forgiven. And then we struggle to forgive our brother that owes us a debt, that may have hurt us, that may have said something wrong about us, that may have talked to us, that 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 that, that may have even defrauded us. And we're going to not forgive that person, and we're going to shake them down, we're going to make them pay, we're going to, and we're going to do all of that stuff. We're going to take vengeance in our own hands, right? And we're going to do all of this stuff. Uh, and we're going to deem that that person doesn't deserve to have his debt forgiven. But I, but I got my debt forgiven far greater than that debt. Is there no mercy in me to extend it to another but when great mercy has been extended to me? And that's really what Jesus is talking about here. All right? So we may have been treated badly by someone else, but it does not compare with our transgressions against God. You may feel no one has it as bad as you do, but you don't realize how badly Jesus was treated. He was innocent, a blameless lamb that was slain. A person who cannot forgive has forgotten the great debt for which they were forgiven. And you realize that Jesus delivered you from eternal death and torment, you will release others unconditionally. And I was confronted with this reality so many years ago. I've been serving the Lord for almost 22 years now, right? And when I came to Jesus and I came to faith, our church shifted their vision and they began to do things a little differently in the church. They began to do small groups and they began to do what is called encounter, counter God weekend, right? Where it was a retreat, right? But it was truly an encounter, it's an encounter Jesus weekend, right? So really what it dealt with, the real main premise, it dealt with inner healing, right? Inner healing, right? And and, and and really the revelation of the cross, right? So we went there and there were several workshops that took place, several workshops. One of the most powerful workshops for me personally, because I've been on both ends of it, I was once ministered to by this workshop, and I also was one of the ministers that ministered to others in the workshop. So I'm going to share the contrast of both with you today to show you how powerful forgiveness is. So when I when I went to when I went to my second encounter retreat, right? They had this thing, they had this workshop called forgiveness, right? And they teach you the value of forgiveness. Pretty similar to what I'm teaching you here today, right? And they tell you what what could happen if you have unforgiveness and the challenges and the struggles we may have in our walk with God the hindrances to our connection with God because of unforgiveness, right? And then, and then the great debt that Jesus paid for us, that his expectations that we forgive others as he forgives us, right? So so everything that we tell us, so then at the end, they do an exercise, right? And then the facilitators, the pastor and some of his team will stand in the front, male and female, and they will stand in the front of the room and they, and, 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 and they will say, listen, Take a moment, allow the Holy Spirit to probe you. If you have any unforgiveness, if anyone has hurt you in your life, if it's a male figure, go to a man up on the platform and then go to him as if that was the person who hurt you. If it's a female, go to that female, right? And do the same thing. So it was what proxy. The leaders were standing in proxy for the individual so forgiveness can happen, right? So, so, so. So I remember going up there because I had issues with both my parents. I had issues with my mom and my dad, right? So I went to the pastor's wife um, representing my mom. And then, you know, I was sharing all the ways that I was hurt by my mom and I released it. And it was hard because was a, a lot of these things were stemming even from childhood. You know, I felt like, you know, I, I didn't, I, I, I was given responsibility too soon. I was leaned on. I felt like, you know, she didn't she 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 didn't allow me to live like other kids. It was a lot of different things, you know. I just felt like she didn't treat me justly in the family. It's all these different things and and 
it developed over time. And I had that harbor in my heart for a long time. And when I released it and then the proxy, you know, began to, you know, speak to me and began to minister to me and say, listen, would you, Mike, would you forgive me? And then, you know, I was able to forgive her, right? And I had a moment in God right there and I wept, hugged her. And it was, it, it was great, man. After that retreat, I actually went directly to my mother and I spoke to her about these things and I forgave her. Now we have such a great relationship today, man. I love my mother dearly. And now, you know, we're walking together. So great. Then I went to the pastor for my father. And I had a lot of father issues, abandonment. My father wasn't always there. He was, you know, he 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 was an alcoholic. He always told me something but never followed through. I used to beg him to come home and be with us. He would say he will come home and then he wouldn't come home. And like, like I ended up to a point that I didn't trust him. I even helped him go to rehab and, and, and he got clean, right? And then he started drinking again, started, you know, getting belligerent again. And I was so angry. I nearly fought my father. I was an adult at the time and my father left and I didn't see him for years, right? So I had all these things bottled up in my father. And I always told so desire a father in my life. So I was always hurting for a father. And went to that, and then that proxy came. And then I was able to gain forgiveness. I was able to release the forgiveness. And then thirdly, I had a childhood cousin. Right? We, we grew up together like brothers, but he was very abusive, very verbally abusive, and sometimes even physically abusive. Like he was one that didn't want to see me with other people and stuff like that, hanging out with other people, that I had to be with him all the time, and it was tough. I grew up with that feeling inadequate, feeling like, 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 you know, I had low self-esteem at the time. So I went to the associate pastor that represented my cousin, who was a male. And I began to tell him everything. And I, I remember I was shaking because the hurt was real. It's as if it was happening to me right there. And I was sharing with him. And then the man of God was like, okay. And he says, like, I'm sorry that I did all of this to you. Would you forgive me? And I said, no, I'll never forgive you. I was I, I was just so angry. And I said, no, I will never forgive you. And he, he, he began to lay hands on me. He began to pray. And he began to minister to me. And then my body started shaking. And I felt the presence of the Lord come into the midst. And my heart started to break. And, I, and, 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 and when he finished praying, I looked up at the man with tears streaming down my face. I said, I... And there I was free. I got set free right at that point. That was the most hardest thing I ever had to go through, right? But I had to go through. It was hindering my walk to that point. And I understand why, because even when I came into the church, I wasn't connecting with the brothers in the church. I isolated, kept to myself. You know what I mean? I would not go. I would not even draw close to any of the leadership. You know, I respected them from afar. I just wanted to go to church, see the word, worship my God and go home. I didn't want to have any entanglement. I didn't want to have any fellowship. That was my reality in the first year, almost two years of my walk with God until I had that moment in that process and I was set free. And I came back, man, I connected to the small group. I connected with my pastor. My pastor became my spiritual father. He began to disciple me and mentor me personally. And, 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 and here I am today. But had I not forgiven I don't know where I would be. That's how powerful forgiveness is, you know? And I recognize that the forgiveness, that, that God's forgiveness for me is so great. How can I withhold forgiveness? That's where I start to default to. Is is when something is hard for me to forgive, I go back and I remember what Jesus did for me. And I said, listen, that doesn't compare to what I did to Jesus that caused him to take what he took from me. It was a debt that I couldn't pay. So why am I holding this debt over this individual? So help me to forgive. And my, and my spiritual father taught me this as he was raising me up over 16 years I was with. He said this one thing. He said, Mike, keep your keep your accounts short. But God is. What he meant by that, he says, forgive and forgive quickly. 
something offends you, forgive quickly. If you offend somebody, ask for forgiveness quickly. Don't allow it to fester. Don't allow the offense to settle. Right? If you feel convicted by the Holy Soul, don't don't waste time. Ask for forgiveness. Repent of that sin. Do it quickly. So you can continue to walk with God. You can continue to progress with God. And I've employed that principle. That is to the point that every time I pray, I'm asking, Lord, Lord, cleanse me. If there's anything in me, help me to release. Help me to forgive. And I've learned to forgive quickly. And before I used to just take everything personally and not let it go. Now I'm able to let it go. Now I can love people to another. I can love people to another level. Right? I get I, I get offended like everybody else, but I don't hold on to the offense. At least I try not to hold on to the You know, and I had offenses. I had spiritual sons slander me. And, I've had a lot of things happen to me as I walk with God. But I've learned to release them. Right? Because I understand how hard it is to forgive. Because I was on the other side of that workshop. When I became a minister, I was one of the people that that, that was the prophet. And I remember one time, the, the pastor's daughter came up to me. Right? Because she was so offended by many, by, by the many men in the church and how they hurt the pastor, her father. And how she witnessed that, even from a child. And even as she grew up to be an adult, she was a young lady at the time. And she came up to me, and I was representative of all those men that heard her father, right? And she had a long letter written, and she was reading specifically the stuff that happened over the years, man. And I was just melting. The, it was it, it hit me so hard because I, I I was just feeling it for her for this young lady. I was like, she carried this for so long, growing up in the church. You know, pastors, kids go through so much. And she was going through all of this stuff. I had no idea. And I used to think that that, that she was a little standoffish. Like, I could never really, like, you know, connect w w w with the kids so much as I would have liked to. You know, they were great kids. You know, they were in the house of the Lord. But if there was something about them, they were very guarded, you know. And now, as she was sharing that, now I'm starting to understand why. And I'm hearing this stuff and the stuff that they've seen happen to their parents. And they see their parents crying themselves to sleep sometimes at night because of what happened to them in the church. And and she's going on and on about these things. And then I began to minister to her. I began to weep and cry. And I began to say to her, I'm sorry all of that happened. Would you forgive us? She started to cry. And she said, yes, I can talk. And I gave her an embrace and I prayed for her. She was set free. And this young lady is doing so much amazing things for God now. She's married, has a wonderful family. She's ministering online. She's very integral in her church. She's a very accomplished. And I'm so amazed to see what God is doing in her life. Right? But this is what forgiveness can do. It breaks the chains. It breaks the yoke. It gives you the inner healing we need. Because do you know that if, you, if you're not healed inside, it's going to affect the exterior? And many of us are suffering from it, right? This is why we have to forgive. We have to allow the Lord to deal with us. We have to allow him to convict us whether it's unforgiveness, right? Because that's the consequence of not forgiving, right? It's not that he's going to withhold his salvation and says, okay, you're no longer saved because you won't forgive this person for hurting you. No, but what happens is that you, it affects your communion with God. It affects you becoming mature in your walk with God. It affects you being used in the kingdom effectively. It affects relationships around you that you have to cultivate and love. It affects even the level of your ministry when you minister to people because you're looking at them through offended eyes. It, 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 it actually affects you from what submitting and connecting to spiritual leaders that the Lord placed over you. You start to equate them with the ones that hurt you or the authority figures in your life that hurt you. And you don't really connect or submit all the way. And then so you're not getting the benefit and the blessing of what God is doing through them. And all these things are happening. Right? So, so, so if that sounds like you, allow the Lord to probe you. Because I believe all of us are dealing with something. 
if we are to keep it real, all of us are dealing with something. Even as I'm preaching this, I just feel inside my heart, right? I, I battled through an offense that I had with my spiritual father for many years, and now I'm free of that because I was able to release him and, and forgive him. And I never, I never publicly said anything negative about him. But inside or in private with my wife, I, I, would, I would share how much I've been hurt, right? But then I heard him preach, and he preached this message about imperfections of a father. And he was so candid and honest about his imperfections, about his challenges, about, you know, the mistakes he's made. And if he had to do it differently, he would do it this way. And he was, and in the midst of that, I remember this one thing he did for me. He did many things for me, don't get me wrong, but this one thing for me made the difference. I was at such a crossroad in my walk with God. I was about to walk away from the faith, or at least I decided to do that. I was about to walk away from the church that had been so good to me because I, I did, my faith was shattered. I was just going through and I felt like God wasn't 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 there for me. Or God didn't, you know. It, it, I sounded like you know God wouldn't answer. God didn't help. God allowed things to happen to me which I didn't deserve. I was offended, even with God, you know. And at that point, I went to church to tell my pastor at the end of the service that I was leaving. And before I could do that, he just threw his arms around me. And he began to love on me and began to whisper affirming words in my ear. He began to tell me how good a man. He began to tell me about destiny and what God has raised me up to do. He began to tell me how loved I am and all these things. And it went on. And in the midst of that, I just felt I encountered the love of Jesus in such a powerful way in that exchange. And when that happened, I I said, no, I cannot leave. I won't leave this car. He loves me so much. I'm going to stay. And he never knew what he did for me that day because I never shared it with him. So I just did. After I heard his message preach, I watched it on YouTube. I texted him and I said to him, Listen, I, I felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to share this with you. And I shared it with him. He was so touched. And he said to me, he said, Listen, I'm with you always. I'll always be there for you, son. I love you, son. And that just meant the world to me, right? That's what forgiveness can do because we lose sight of the other things. We lose sight of the good that people do because we're hanging up on one thing that's offensive. And we may not understand that we're all human beings and we all have failings, right? But Jesus could understand the human failing because he took on flesh, right? And he still died for us anyway. While we were yet sinners, he died for us, right? He didn't withhold his forgiveness. He didn't withhold his, 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 his what? Atonement and redemption for us. He did it anyway. So now the expectation is that we do the same. We respond with forgiveness. We release those that hurt us. But ultimately... The greatest benefit of forgiveness is for you, the one who's forgiven, the one who's released. Because when you hold it, when you have a debt, you're bound. When you, when you, when you, 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 you're, you're holding somebody under debt, you are bound by that. You cannot sleep or rest until that debt is paid. And if that debt is never paid, you're constantly tormented by it. Do you know, and I want to share this really quickly. I got it from the book. But I want to share this very quickly, and I really believe that this, this is true. Medical doctors and scientists have linked unforgiveness and bitterness with certain diseases, such as arthritis and cancer. Many cases of mental sickness are tied to bitter unforgiveness. So even in the natural, when we have unforgiveness in our heart and bitterness in our heart, it can what manifest in sickness and disease. Sometimes we get, we have mental challenges and mental illness. We become paranoid, right? We become what? We, we, we start to, we start to perceive things more. We become schizophrenic. Why? Because that bitterness, what is framing what we're seeing. Our minds are paying tricks on us. And this mental illness is a huge thing in our society today. People are mentally ill. These scientists and doctors have linked 
that it could possibly be, I'm not saying in every case, but it could possibly be unforgiveness and bitterness. The certain sicknesses that you have that 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 can be attributed to sickness, to I mean to to unforgiveness and bitterness. So imagine if we're able to release that, to obey God, to forgive lest we be forgiven, right? To apply this principle, right? To forgive the dead, understanding that our debt was was, was far greater and has been released by the Lord, that we can release it to others. If we have that mentality, we live free. We live free. We live in constant communion with God. We continue to grow in the knowledge of God. We continue to love as God loves. His love is an unconditional love. Why? How? Because he has no offense. He's, he's willing to forgive. He's willing to forgive. He's not holding back forgiveness. Forgiveness is available, but he's also asking you to forgive too. Make it right. Don't, 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 don't owe anybody anything but love. That's how we should walk. And this is a major thing that we need to what? Deal with our inner man. Right? Many of us mask these things and then act like we're good, but when we're alone, we're suffering silence. It's because we are unwilling to deal with the hurts and the pains that are inside of us. We're unwilling to forgive those that have hurt us. And some of this is real trauma. Real trauma that happens that people that have been molested when they were a child, right? And can never get over it, right? It causes them to be promiscuous, right? It causes them not to be in steady relationships, right? They're going from, you know, if it's a woman, from man to man. And even boys that get molested are that way. Sometimes it even causes them to alter their lifestyle because they don't, they don't trust women because a woman molested them. They become what homosexual, and then they start loving men. They only have eyes for men. They can they, they don't have any attraction to women. And all these things happen because a trauma happened in their lives that they never released. They never dealt with. They buried it, and they think they're fine, and they think everything's so. Many of these things in society are a result of the sin of unforgiveness. Is because we have received a trauma, a, a hurt. Right? And we have not released it. We have not forgiven it. Right? So we may be forgiven, but we're walking around with unforgiveness, and then the consequence of the unforgiveness is plaguing our lives for as long as we don't deal with it. But if you want to be free of that, right, you want to walk without any unforgiveness and bitterness, you want to walk in the destiny that God has for your life, Right? Release. Release. But don't release because you want to be great in God. Release it because God is going to release you. Understand what he has done for you. Do it to honor God. Do it to obey God. Because it's all about God. If he can forgive a, a $14.5 billion debt, you can surely forgive a $4,000. That's the equivalent in the spiritual realm. But the benefits are far outweigh the difficulty of you having to forgive somebody that deeply hurt you. I understand. I understand what it means to be deeply hurt. I shared the story when I was even before in the presence of God, before a man of God, in a proxy, and I still couldn't forgive that individual because he hurt me so bad. And the Holy Spirit had to intervene and the man of God had to minister me first. I, I might have been up there like almost almost 30 minutes, 40 minutes until that breakthrough came. But then it came because I came to the point where I could forgive. He had broken my heart. He had, he had broken me and brought me to the place of humility and say, oh Lord, I can forgive him now. And that's when the freedom came. That's how I love people the way I love them today because I keep short accounts with people. I do my best to do it. But I'm human like you. There's times that I have challenges. I was hurt deeply a few years ago by a spiritual son. And it took me a little while to get over that. To be able to release him. And not retaliate when he was slandered. And hold back my tongue and but pray for him. 
right? To pray for him fervently that the Lord would, would, would reach his heart, right? That whatever offense he's carrying, that he can release it, that he could forgive me if I hurt him, whatever it is, so he could be free in God and continue to progress in God, right? That is really the crux of what we've been dealing with in this series. Because forgiveness is what breaks us free from the trap that Satan puts us in, right? The beta Satan, right? It's a Greek word called scandalon. Scandalon is a trap. And in the trap, there's a bait, right? And this is how they caught wild animals, right? So they put the bait there. The wild animals will take the bait, go into the trap, and they'll stand on the scandalon, and it will trigger the trap, and the trap will capture them, and they're in bondage. They're held. This is what the enemy uses the offensive. Look at it as a bait. And then when we take the bait, we're trapped in the bondage of the unforgiveness and bitterness and all the things that result from unforgiveness. But when we forgive, it breaks the trap and we are set free. And now we can move again. And now we can progress again. And now we can see the glory of God again. And now we escape. I was free. Jesus offered us a way to freedom, to live each day. And it's a principle of forgiveness because he already, he already paid for that on the cross. He redeemed us so we can. And we can go to him for forgiveness and we can forgive all. That's the key to this walk. So the question is, would you allow God to deal with you? Would you allow him to release you? and to set you free today. Amen. I'm going to stop right here. Praise God. Praise God, everybody. So, Bishop, I know you were in and out, but hopefully you got the gist of what I was sharing. Uh, I'll ask you to share whatever thoughts you may have before we close out. Okay, thank you for the honor and opportunity uh, for me to share what I have extracted from this teaching today. I would like firstly to greet in the name of Jesus and the prophetess. Thank you for the honor for leading us and teaching us today on this session. My greetings also and honor to Pastor Clovis and Pastor Dali and all the pastors and ministers in the platform as well as Mama Andy. My greetings to her. I have learned today uh, some keys which can give release, which can give relief, which can make one's life free in himself through just forgiving someone who might have done wrong to you or even yourself to be forgiven by God so that you can be also free. So I have learned from what you were sharing that unforgiveness is a sin and it's not something that a believer should always keep. And there was a key which you shared where you say your spiritual father told you that if you have done wrong to someone, rush some to that person quickly and ask for forgiveness. And if there's any offense which you have with someone, be quick to resolve it. That can give you relief. And I was also getting from this teaching how also you spoke about how mentally people can get to be, to be disturbed if they carry for unforgiveness in themselves. They can have even physical uh, sickness and diseases because of just keeping things in their heart and not sharing them uh, to the people whom they might have offended to say, I am sorry. So I have just quoted from this teaching how much weight here uh, this unforgiveness carries in a person's heart uh, besides everything that he can have in his life. And, uh, and I have seen this is true much that this is a, a good teaching which we, we must run with muchly because the bait of Satan is muchly 
running along this line of unforgiveness. We have believers, we have people, as believers, even ourselves, we are much struggling to forgive people who might have done wrong to us. People are struggling to forgive each other in families, uh, even in churches, people, they offend each other. Uh, in life, with neighbors, in society, people are just against each other. And as you said, that it's not the devil who offends, but he, he traps you with the offense. That's when, he gets, that's when he gets his bait. And this is true. That's how it is happening. And people, they live bound that someone can not visit his brother cannot relate with his parents, cannot relate with his sister or with friends or colleagues at work or even at churches. People cannot relate, but they are in the same church, they're in the same service. That Sunday, they are there together, but this family and that family, they don't see each other eye to eye. They go even for two or four or five weeks without talking to each other to say, my brother, I'm sorry, or even intervene the pastors or others to say we have problems among us and we should forgive each other as well as you shared the scripture that says you have something against your brother leave your gift beside and go and resolve with your brother then come and offer but we see these people they're offering their gifts without resolving issues with people and uh, some are not coming out to lie to say i have something in my heart that you offended me or that i am offended by you May we resolve this. They are just living with it. So these things are true, Apostle, which you are just sharing. And this is the very vibrant area of our gospel and of our, our, our journey with the Lord. Because truly, it's not an advantage that someone has wronged me. Then I carry that he has done wrong to me and I don't forgive him. It's another way that God will forgive me if I forgive him. So that's where the enemy can have that bound upon us to say, when you keep with that unforgiveness to that person, you continue to be bound and you don't get forgiveness from God. Then it brings nothing to our lives. So, so grateful of this teaching. And I love this teaching. And I love a teaching about forgiveness and unforgiveness because I know these things in my life, there are some areas I have lived unforgiving. I have lived. Amen. Looks like you might have frozen, but thank you, Bishop. Thank you for sharing um, what you got from the teaching. I, I'm so glad that it really impacted you so, because this teaching is just not merely sharing information. It's really an important that is meant the to gospel. Control. It helped me. Amen. Yeah. So yeah, you froze for a while, uh, Bishop. But, okay, sorry. No, yeah, no, no. but these things are these things are true and they are very great. And I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. Amen. I give this time back to you. Amen. Thank you so much, Bishop, for for sharing your heart and sharing your sentiments and. And I'm so grateful that the the teaching really impacted you so. And, you know, my prayer is that this teaching will go beyond just the sharing of information, right? That it will be a true impartation that will activate the love and the power of God inside of us to deal with the inner person, right? Because we often neglect the inner person, right? And we may not even have an offense. Or we may not even have a need to forgive someone else for what they've done. But it may be that we we feel condemned in our own lives because we may have failed at things or we may have been disappointed a lot in our lives and things didn't work out. Relationships didn't work out with us and we had a lot of disappointment. And so we start to look at ourselves and we start to be condemned inside and we start to think that we're worth nothing. And that can be also um, a level of unforgiveness that keeps us bound in condemnation, 
Because the word of the Lord says that, that those that are in Christ, there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, right? We should not be in condemnation or feeling guilty or feeling less than, right? Because, because if we recognize that the Lord has set us free, then we are free indeed. And we are free from that. Then what we may, what we need to do is forgive ourselves. Right? Forgive ourselves. Just as the Lord forgave us, forgive yourself. Release yourself. Release yourself so you can walk in the what? The plan and destiny that God created you for. You matter. You understand? No matter where you are right now, no matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, you matter to God. He loves you dearly. And he wants you to live according to his sin. According to his design, not beneath your place that he created you in. You are kings and priests of the Lord. So, so we may need to forgive ourselves and release our own. Thank you, Bishop. Mama, do you have anything you want to share before we close out in prayer? It's, it's almost like a question. Sure. Uh, I, I understood forgiveness. Mm -hmm. <coughs> mm -hmm. That you should forgive yourself first before you forgive the other person. Should you forgive them even if they don't ask for forgiveness? Or you can just forgive them in absentia? And is it okay uh, to 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 forgive them, but you don't forget what they did. You occasionally talk about it. Is it okay to do that? Um, let me let me answer it this way. Okay, All right. When uh, when we look at forgiveness, I'm gonna define it in the terms that God defines forgiveness, not the way we right. forgiveness. Right? We look at forgiveness differently. Mm -hmm. We say forgiveness like, yes, I forgive you for that particular thing you did, but I'm not going to forget the fact that you did it, right? So I'm still going to treat you differently, right? But I'm not going to hold what you mm. did against me, right? That's forgiving and saying, listen, I'm not going to forget, right? Right? Human beings mm -hmm. are hard to forget, even if it's a tra whatever trauma, whatever hurt. It's hard for us to forget or let it go or act like it never happened. It's hard for us to do that, Right? But God's way of forgiveness is this. When he forgives, he forgets. Right? They say that he, the Bible says that he throws our sin in the sea of forgetfulness. Meaning that he remembers it no more. Right? So so, so now he doesn't treat us differently. He treats us what? the way he would as if we didn't sin. That's what justification. That's what the work of the cross provided for us is that level of forgiveness. So it's that level of forgiveness that God is requiring us as believers and as followers of Jesus to give to us. Right? His, he did that unsolicited. Right? It's not because we were begging him to die for our sins that he did it. He did it out of love. Right? He did it out of unconditional love. So all he re all requests from us as his followers is to forgive others as he has forgiven us, right? So I don't know if that answers your question all the way because I know on our end, that's hard. I'm not saying that forgiving somebody is easy. It's not. We need what? The help of the Holy Spirit to help us to forgive people to that level, right? So sometimes, yes. it's, sometimes it's a process to forgive. It's not something that could immediately happen. So I share, I shared in my teaching both of both of those scenarios, right? How I've been able to forgive people quickly, but then <clears throat> times where I had to go through a process, it took me time. You know, for example, the 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 hurt I felt with my spiritual father, and the hurt that I got from my spiritual son, right? That 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 hurt me so deeply because they're so close to me that I couldn't just release them right away. It, it stayed with me for a while. I couldn't forget. It was hard. You know, so 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 I I saw how it was just kind of eating me away, you know. And I thank God for my wife who ministered to me through these things, 
And then I began to go to a process of healing and of releasing. But now I don't hold it again. You know, I speak often about my spiritual father right on this platform. But you've never heard me speak a negative word of him. Why? Because he's relieved because I love him. It's as if he never hurt me. You know, but God helped me do that. I didn't do that by myself because it's hard for me to forget. Right? That's what I'm saying. This is this is, has to happen in conjunction with the Holy Spirit. This cannot happen in your own strength because we cannot forgive the way God forgives in our own strength. So it's a great question that you asked, ask, Mama. Great question. Right? Because that's, that's where the struggle is for all of us to forgive. That's why it's so hard to forgive. Because we say, no, but, you know, but that person hurt me. Yeah, I'm going to forgive him because that's what I'm required to do, right? You know, I want, I, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to live godly, so I'm gonna, that's what I'm going to do. But we don't understand the spiritual implications, of it, right? We understand that, that, that the forgiveness is actually beneficial to the one that's giving the forgiveness, right? Because, because Jesus made mm -hmm. us to be forgiven. Now, what does he have? He has a kingdom on earth. And he has his mission going from place to place. Not that God couldn't do it without us. Of course he can. But his plan was to involve us. Right? So he made a way to redeem and to put everything back in the proper order. Right? That he can return again and set everything back in place. Right? All of that stuff was for the benefit of the kingdom advance. Right? So when we, who are connected with God, do the same, then our benefit is that it actually brings us intimacy with God and communion with God and we can continue to advance in a plan and purpose and what God designed us to be and to do, right? It, there's no hindrances between us and God, right? And that is the joy that we have in serving God, right? That we can be, we can dwell in his presence and we can move in his purpose and we can see the glory of God come and, and wait for the hope of his promise to be fulfilled. Right, that's the that that's the joy we have as a believer. Even though we're going to hurt, even though people are offending us, even though we get persecuted, criticized, right? We get sick out of the blue, and we don't understand why we're getting sick, and we pray and pray, and the healing doesn't seem to come, and we're saying, "Well, why, oh God, are you forsaking me?" And all of these different things, right? But when we continue to release, so sometimes we even get mad, we get offended by God because our expectations are not being met, and we. Uh, and we could be angry at God. And then that hurts our community. But when we can release, we can forgive, we can be free now to progress and move forward in life. Because when we hold the unforgiveness, right? when we hold the unforgiveness, it's going to affect our life, affect our relationship, affect how we view circumstances and situations, right? Affect who we're going to connect with and who we're not going to connect with. It affects every area of our life. Right? And it could even have a physical component, as I shared at the end of my teaching. It could either you know, lead to mental illness and even physical illness. Right? And that's how devastating it is. So, so God wants us to live free, above the fray. Right? Because he has already set us free. But he doesn't want us to live beneath that standard of so we must allow him to deal with the inner man because we come into the kingdom with a lot of issues that we bring in. And that is what he that that is that is what these kind of teachings do. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He probes us and deals with us if we yield and allow him to do what he has to do in us. Recognize that we have issues, that we have challenges, that we may have offenses and we may have unforgiveness. Lord help me. Help me to be free. Let me be free of that. Help me to be able to release these people that did these horrible things to me. Please, Lord. Because I want to I want to walk with you. I want to be more like you. I want to love like I want to live for you. Please. And then the Holy Spirit will come, minister to deal with you, help to do what you cannot do by yourself. So hopefully I answer your question, Mama. Yes, yes, but I was thinking of it. All right, praise God. <clears throat> Thank you both for joining me. So, so I pray that you guys will 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 help me advocate for for these teachings. I think they're very important, not because I'm teaching them, it's because I've experienced the benefit of, them, you know, 
Um, and I know how all of us are struggling and suffering through this. We are dealing with issues and we are trying to lead and minister out of our pain. And a lot of times it leads to a greater struggle, but it doesn't have to be that way. Jesus relieved us of an enormous debt when he saved us, when he died on that cross. And now he given us the key to unlock the inner hurt and to set us free from that. So we can what? Be all we can be for him and his perfect plan in his kingdom. So we can become more effective, more loving, more nurturing. Dare I say it more like Jesus. That's the crux of the matter. So please advocate for this. Please encourage the other people to, to, to listen to the replay, to listen to the recording, right? Let's start engaging on the platform. Not only with my teaching, but with the teach, David's teaching and whoever comes on this platform and teach. Let's engage it. Let's, 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 let's have discussions come up. Let people share their insight and their love. Let's, 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 let's sharpen each other and let's grow together. Let's do that so we can what? Move together in love, right? In love as we honor and worship our King. Amen. So I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to pray. Father in heaven, I just thank you. I thank you for this time. I pray that this Teaching continues to have ripple effects in our lives, Lord God. Father, let not me be exempted from it. Let it let it hit me just as hard as it's hitting everybody else. Father, deal with me in the depths of my being, Lord God. I may think I'm good, but I may not be good, Lord God. You know, you know, even the things that I buried and I just try to forget, Lord God, deal with that. Deal with that in our hearts, Lord God. The secret things, Lord God, that no one knows, Lord God. And we we, 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 we endeavor to forget that. Father, bring them to the service, no matter how painful it might be, Lord God, because you, Lord God, desire that we will be break free from the bait and the trap of Satan, Lord God, to keep us in that place, to keep us bitter and angry and upset, to keep us, oh God, from connecting and submitting and, and, and growing in our faith and to keep us, Lord God, from fulfilling our purpose and destiny in you. Those things that, 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 that hinder us from loving our families and loving our kids and our spouses the way we should love. Those things that cause us to have challenges on our job when we're trying to work that, that, that doesn't allow us to excel or progress, Lord God, and even in those things as well. Lord God, help us. Help us to be free. Help us to forgive as we have been forgiven. And Lord, that we will break the yoke of that sin and we will be free and people will know that we are disciples because they will see the love that we have for each other. We thank you. Lord, we bring mama to you once again, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God. We ask for your cleansing blood to come upon her. Cleanse her from the inside out, Lord God, and let your healing virtue be released in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord God. Father, as she continues in the process of healing, Lord God, Father, get to the root, Lord. You heal by the root. Doctors may treat symptoms, but you heal, Lord. So, Lord God, we invoke your healing virtue right now over her life, Lord God. We stand in faith believing because we said, Lord God, that if we believe that we have received it, we shall have it. So, Lord God, we believe that the healing has come from us, Lord God. So, Father, in case we have ought with someone, in case there's something that's hindering our connection, Lord God, deal with it right now, Lord God. Break it, Lord God, in Jesus' name. That, we, that I, Lord, in the name of Jesus, stand on behalf of those that are praying and agreeing with me here, Lord, that we will release all that offended us. We would ask you to forgive our transgressions once again, Lord God, and that we will forgive those that have transgressed against us. Lord God, that we will have clear communion with you, Lord God, in this moment, Lord God, that you will be that you will freely move, Lord God, without hindrance, Lord God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Set Mama free from the inside out. And I pray these things in no other name but the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. 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 All right. Until next week, I'll see you all. God bless you. And enjoy the rest of your evening. God bless Amen. You too. Thank you, too.